Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to the Pastoral Thoughts Podcast. This is your host, Jack Young. And today, in office, in studio, uh, we have once again with us Pastor Bruce Craig, and we have a special topic for the day, and that is going to be the topic, very important topic of grief. And uh, Pastor Craig has pastored for decades and has a wealth of experience and knowledge just dealing with people. And so it's going to be a great episode, and and uh, we're looking to the Lord to bless us today. So thanks for being with us. My privilege. Once again. My privilege. And so we're going to talk about grief, and you you get us started here wherever you want to go. Well, I enjoyed the last podcast we mm-hmm. did, and uh, I was surprised a lot of other people did too. So, Amen. So that was a blessing. Amen. And that, and, it was. It was fascinating. Right. And and in my present ministry, there are several things that I major on. One is prophecy. Mm-hmm. Uh, one is uh, finances. And then the other one is grief. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't really see the... Excitement about grief. I mean, who no. would? But I, the reality one on one, right? But and so your your job as pastor was to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable, right? Right. Yeah, I I think that uh, a lot of pastors underestimate the grief that people in their church are going through mm-hmm. because they don't the people don't talk about it that much, you know, and they're it's a burden they have, uh, but they don't feel there's any real relief for it. So yeah, uh, it's a it's a silence, and unless the pastor has gone through his own personal grief. A mm-hmm. lot of times you don't have empathy for people who are suffering in grief. Right. I had a, I, I managed a grief share uh, ministry for a couple of years mm-hmm. uh, where basically we would meet together and bear one another's burdens and talk about it. And, and it's amazing, you know, how people hurt long-term, mm-hmm. you know, we, we give them a couple of weeks back to work, you know, everything's fine. And that's yeah. just not the way it is. No. And uh, with the with, with with my experience, unless you have, you know, somebody loses a grandmother, they're eighty five years old. That's sad. They grieve. Mm-hmm. But when you lose a child uh, or a, a a partner, life partner yes. of some sort, it's a whole different thing. It's not that the other. I'm not diminishing the other. Yeah, but I, it's, it's I'll give I'll thing. give you an example because um, your grandson right now is having a graduation party. We mm-hmm. just stuffed ourselves with hot dogs and hamburgers right. and came in here, and we're gonna try to talk before all the food hits our bloodstream. Right. Uh, but I was in line, and there's a fellow you know, Bob Rotman. So he's here. So Bob lost his spouse Debbie three years ago. Bob is I want to say about sixty. And, uh, but his t-shirt said the way, the truth and the life. I said, Hey Bob, I got that same t-shirt. Where'd you get that? And he said, uh, my, my Debbie, that's what he called it. My oh, Debbie yeah. get, got that for oh, me. Oh yeah, that's sweet. And, um, yeah, you could still, there's still an open wound there, you know, and he's still grieving the loss of yep. his, his wife. Grief can go through, uh, up to four years. Mm-hmm. Sometimes people get stuck in grief. We can talk about that too. Mm-hmm. People get stuck in grief, and it's it's a lifetime thing. I had a a couple years ago uh, where they basically grew up. You know, the boy and girl next door went to school together. Mm-hmm. You know, graduated high school together, got married. You know, lived their whole life, raised their children, and when her husband died, his heart blew apart on the streets of Buff of uh, of Butler, Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. And uh, she went into her home, closed the curtains, and basically never went out. Died of a brain tumor. You know, after a yes. few, after a few months, uh, she was stuck in grief. Couldn't make you know mm-hmm. plans or think about the future. I mean, life was over for her. Yes. And how often do you see where an older person, their wife dies, their husband dies, and then they're very, gone very quickly after? Right. So I mean, that's and it, it's a very important subject. Right. And uh, I, th- I think a lot of times also it's related to um, if, if the couple had children and how obligated the parent feels to the children. Uh, but if you have, they were c- completely intertwined in their partner, which is not a bad thing. I mean, the Bible does say right. leave leave your um, uh, man supposed to leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. These mm-hmm. two become one. So That's that true. other person is your life. Uh, yep. And so that that part of your life is, has right. died. When my wife passed away, I had lost, you know, grandparents. I lost my grandfather. I was very close to him. My grandmother, you know, other family members, but nothing compared to losing a wife of 31 years. Uh, that was just unbelievable. It's probably unexplainable too. Yes. Because you are, we're going to talk about narrow pathways sure. in a bit, uh, but I have seen, um, 
um, shows on people's brains and actually husbands and wives who have been living together for over 20 years, their, their uh, brain waves are synced. That's so true. When they test, yes. yeah, they, 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 um, the neural pathways and everything, they're mm-hmm. the same. I mean, so you, you are joined together, body, soul, and spirit. Amen. That's right. They, any experience you have makes a pathway in your brain mm-hmm. and it's called neural pathways. Any experience you have. So if I were to not, if I didn't know you, and I saw you on the street, and I said hello, and you said hello. A little pathway is there, but it's not going to mount to anything, and it'll basically shrink to nothing. Mm-hmm. It'll always be there, but right. you won't know about it. That's why if I, by mistake, cut somebody off and they blow the horn, I always say, ah, they want to remember it in a week. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's true. No, yeah. That'll be fine. That's true. Yeah. But when you're with somebody day after day after mm-hmm. day, that little pathway Mm-hmm. It's like a little path, and then it becomes like a little, you know, highway. And, and, and you guys are synchronated right. together. Uh, yeah. When I had somebody on the podcast, now you and I have known each other for a long time, and you know, we we see each other pretty frequently. Mm-hmm. So we're kind of we're kind of synced up. We know each yep. other. Uh, but if I had someone on the podcast, I'll always go like to lunch with them first, and mm-hmm. howdy, and chat, and laugh, and you know, tell jokes and things because we're syncing up. Mm-hmm. Before we come on the podcast, right. or else it would take a while for us to start jiving together. Yeah. Yeah. But you have a husband and a wife. I mean, day after day, all the routines and patterns of life have been living heirs of the grace of life together, as the Bible right. says. Um, they're so intertwined; it's almost unexplainable how how um, how interwoven newer pathways will, will, will cause a projection, oftentimes, and. Uh, for the sake of the audience, so they understand, um, a man gets his hand cut off, but his fingers itch. Right. Well, there's no finger there, but that's the neural neural pathways projecting because the brain doesn't realize the hand is gone, mm-hmm. so it acts as if the hand is there. Same way if you cut off your leg, whatever. And when a person that's that, when you have a major neural pathway with a wife or a husband, uh, for instance, when my wife died, I woke up one morning, I was holding her hand. Ah. Uh. That was freaky okay yeah and i had another experience like that with her in that situation and i think that's where a lot of ghost stories come in whatever i think so too projection my now my mother lost her father when she was a senior in high school so it's very traumatic for the whole family he was the breadwinner and then also he was the leader of the home very strong Mm -hmm. guy um and my grandmother bertha uh she would hear her husband calling bert bert she That's what she would hear. It, she yeah. would hear it. Yes. And again, we say oh, a ghost or whatever. But I mean, for years she'd right. been hearing that. Um, and so there were this, the brain has something. There's some involvement yeah. there with yes. the brain. Yes. That's, yeah. That's why, you know, I, I think that, you know, I lost, I've lost ever just about everybody in my past, you know, my mother, my father, my stepfather, my grandparents. And I lost Wesley three year old, grandson Mm -hmm. at three years of age that was really bad i mean that was really bad but nothing compared you know to wife of 31 years and Mm -hmm. and like you said it's because that presence is still there in the brain yeah you know and it's it's stuff i brought some notes too so i hope you'll forgive me for that i know this oh yeah no no free will yeah no we'll get get right into the notes yeah but uh you know it's it's something that uh, that is a, a special club you know, you can say, well, I lost my grandmother. She was 85, and that's tough. Mm-hmm. But when you lose somebody that you've been connected with, uh, you're in a special club. You know, I, right. when I started the uh, Grief Share, and that is a, it's an international program, mm-hmm. and I had to tweak it some to fit our independent Baptist you know, <laughs> sure, mentality. Absolutely, yeah. uh, but when I started that, one of the main things was, you know, you don't let somebody in that lost her dog. You know what I mean? Right. Okay, you're grieving. You lost your dog, but it's not. This, it's insult. Yes. Those have had loss of you know, a loved one. Absolutely, and so it's it's a special club, mm-hmm. and it's a it's a position where your naive naivete will never go away. Or, you know, will never you'll never be as innocent as you were before. That's right. You know, and people that haven't been there do not understand, and that's why it's important that we not act like we understand. We can give sympathy and pity. 
but we don't act like we really understand when we don't because that's an insult as well. Absolutely. And 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 uh, we were going to talk about this a little bit, and as you get into it, it'll help us pastors, it'll help grieving people, but um, there there's also uh, a lot of godly laymen who want to comfort their fellow church members mm-hmm. when they're going through grief. I, I was reading something one time, and I took this counsel and advice, and I think that has helped me over the years. Because just to be frank and honest, I've, I like really, you know, my 42 years, it seems like it's just blue, nothing but blue skies and, you know, wind at my back. And I really, I mean, honestly, I haven't had to go through deep, dark valleys yet. I mean, they're coming. That's, that's good. Um, I can it, remember when I said that too. <laughs> right. I, you know, and I know it's ahead and that's why, uh, you know, this podcast will help us as well. But I was reading, uh, I was reading an article about this fella and his wife who lost their, it's like a one-year-old child which is very traumatic and he said you know what helped the most he said people just who told us hey we love you and we're praying for right, you right right and i've said that over and over again and i've tried to mean it as yeah, well you know yeah. but um i can't say hey i know what you're going through because i right, don't right but i can say hey i love you and i'm praying for you 90 percent of couples that lose us a child divorce mm-hmm. i mean it's tremendous divorce rate you know for that but you know it's it's better to say little, you know, than to than to say a lot and put your foot in it. That's right. You know, and that's that's what a lot of people will, they they mean well, but they'll say they lose it. I know one couple they lost a child, and somebody comes along and says, "Well, you can have another one." It's like it's not replacing a puppy. Mm, no, you, you know, no. And so it's better not to say anything, anything. than to say really something. Right, you know, that's, and that's why. I th- it's safe to say, hey, we love you guys. We love right. you. We're praying for you. And on the other side, the grieving person doesn't know what to say. Mm-mm. And that's why, you know, if you're grieving, uh, one of the best things to say, you know, people say, oh, hey, how are you doing? And what they're really saying is, you know, you better be doing better. I'm, I expect you to do better. That's right. You know, you know, or or uh, I'm saying, you know, how are you doing? Because, you know, I want, you know, you need to be doing better. And yeah. that's the way it's interpreted. Yeah. But the grieving person, how they should respond is saying, well, I'm working on it. Mm-hmm. See, and mm-hmm. that just diffuses the whole thing. I'm, right. I'm working on right. it. Right. So it's not, it's yeah. not, they're not saying, well, pity me, pity me. And they're not saying I'm better, but they're saying I am progressing or trying to work on it. Now, we all know the story of Job's friends, and he had a lot of grief that he was going right. through. Uh, and, you know, it was three days. Now, so they traveled, and, you know, travel was slow then. They tra- They traveled to him, and they said, if I'm, remember correctly, for three days in silence with Job. Yes. So they were great friends until they opened up their mouth. <laughs> That's true. That's and, true. And, I mean, they were a comfort to him when they were yep. just there present. Right. And, I mean, obviously you're going to, you know, uh, greet a person or whatever if you want to go be with them. Uh, but, yeah, you don't have to dig in. Right. You don't have to be their psychiatrist. You know, just show yourself present. Let them know that you love them. Let them know that you're praying for them. A grieving person is schizophrenic. I don't mean that in a clinical sense. Mm -hmm. But they're schizophrenic in the sense that they want to be a part, but they don't want to be a part. Mm -hmm. I can remember, you know, I would want to go somewhere, like a party or whatever, but I didn't want to go to the party. You know, yeah. so I'd go late and leave early, make up some excuse, leave early. Sure. And I, I wanted to be there, but I wanted to be by myself. You said, hey, I have a podcast to do. We're going to have to yeah. leave this party. <laughs> exactly. Something. <laughs> make up yeah. some excuse. You right, know? right. And, and uh, sometimes you just had to force yourself. Uh-huh. I remember the first time back in the pulpit, and that, I was only out, of, I don't remember how long, a couple of weeks. That was about it. Mm-hmm. But it was Sunday school, and a voice in my head is almost audible said, you can't do this. Mm-hmm. And I said, I'm going to do this. And you can't do that. Yes, I can. And uh, I had a revival meeting in Thompson, Canada a uh-huh. few weeks after that as well. And it's the first time, you know, we went everywhere together. Mm-hmm. And it was the first time I ever went to a meeting without my wife. Mm-hmm. And getting on that plane was one of the hardest things I had to do in my whole life. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, you know, to make that transition. If, if you had uh, uh, had the chance to go back and counsel yourself back then, uh, what were some? What would be some of the things you'd tell yourself? I would tell myself to be more open with my grief. Mm-hmm. Now I know some pastors that, you know, that's the topic every Sunday. If they lose their wife, is their grief, right? And I said to myself, I'm not going to do that because I've come to minister, and not be not to be ministered unto. Mm-hmm. Okay, and and we had I pastored a year single, mm-hmm. and uh, which I would not recommend, but right. I, you know I did. 
But we had people be there, you know, new people, two, three months, and wonder where the pastor's wife was because mm-hmm. I didn't make a big deal out of yeah. it. Yeah. Going back and looking back at it, I think it'd been better for the church and the family if I'd have let at least let out a little bit of that. In in pastors, you know, you're kind of like the you're kind of like a father mm-hmm. in the sense you don't want to trouble your children with your own personal problems, right? Like right. you don't tell your kids, I don't know how we're going to make ends meet this month, and they might shut yep. the electric off and this and that. Uh, but that would have been the time to let your church family know that mm-hmm. this is really tough on me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, and I, you know, I stiff upper lip, you know, buck up, right, that kind of thing. And you probably grew up that way. I and did. I did as well. And, Absolutely. Yeah. You know, so I think I would have been a little more transparent. Yes. Not not a lot. Yes. But, but enough to let people know that uh, this is not an easy thing for me. Mm-hmm. You know, because. I think that a lot of people wanted to see that. Yeah. Some inordinately so. Sure. Some people wanted to see, you know, grief and tears, which that's that was not going to happen. Right. But a little more would have been good. Right. I I think I did, and this sounds arrogant maybe, but I think I did more things right than I did wrong for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, sure. And, you know, one, one of the ways I attacked it was the way I attack every problem. I was in the Bible. I read through the Psalms over and over Amen. and over and over again. Amen. I read through seven books on grief, and yeah. you know when you think about it, you know when you read a book on a subject, it's the same as a going to a semester college lecture. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I had you know seven semesters of yeah, especially you got a highlighter and a pen, right? Yeah, I ruin every yeah. book I, I look at. So yeah, yeah, me too. I mark yeah. them up and make them my own. Right. So I learned a lot, and I could tell. Is, is there is there some uh, some books that you would recommend for people? I could t- I could tell the authors that knew what they were talking about. Okay. And the ones that hadn't, uh, yeah. uh, Lewis. C.W. Lewis? Is that C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis, right. He's got a book on a grief observed. Yeah. And I'm not a total... And, and it's kind of autobiographical. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Autobiography. He, he was, yeah, yeah, like, yeah, he was recording his own experiences and what he went through. Right. And I found that... And he did have a good. hard life. Yes, he did. He yes, had he some did. great sorrows. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, I'm not promoting him particularly, but that is a good book to read. Yeah. You know, so that'd be one yeah. I, would, yeah. I would think of right off the top of my head. You know, but I would, you know, find some good Christian literature yeah. and, and, and read it. Yeah. Grief, grief Share has some tremendous things out. Mm-hmm. And so you can go online. Yeah. I'm not sure what the rules are, of, you know, buying individual books and that. I think you can. Yeah. Uh, but uh, Zig Ziglar okay. uh, has quite a bit of stuff out. No that, kidding. That's I gr- did not. On grief. I, I just think stuff. of him as a motivational writer. Right. Yeah. No, he's got some excellent material okay. on, on grief. Okay. Yeah. So and, and enjoyed that. Okay. Uh, the the grief share idea, and, and then the Psalms too. I read through that, the Psalms that's over, rec- and over and that, over. You would recommend that to yeah. somebody who's who's grieving, right? Is because you you can identify yourself with the psalmist who's going through so the much. same emotions you are. Yes, and you can pray those prayers. I th- you know I believe the Psalms are really patterned prayers. One of the, yes. of prayers. Yeah, I would pray through them. Yeah, mm-hmm. use them as a prayer. Guide. Uh, yeah, guide or yeah. springboard. Yes. The Bible's like a smorgasbord. Am you I? can you can read through the Psalms and get something out of it, you know, different every time you Absolutely. get down the line. Absolutely. And I guess I never thought much about the mercy of God. Mm-hmm. And But when I was reading through the Psalms, every verse is about the mercy, <laughs> mercy of God. It was really bizarre. Not every verse, but a lot of it was about the mercy of God. You know, so the mercy... And then also the preservation of the saints to all the yes. Calvinist brethren out there. <laughs> right. This Psalms is your right. treasure trove right. Right. about keeping me, oh Lord, yep. Yep. and then have mercy upon me. Yeah. Because why that's important is because one of the stages of grief has to do with, uh, with, with anger mm-hmm. and, and guilt. Mm-hmm. A lot of it has to do with guilt. And, sure. and, and it's irrational guilt. Sure. But one of the stages of grief is is uh, going through a period of guilt. What could have I? What, what could I have done better? What should I have done differently? And it might not even be about the person's death. Uh, it could it be like regret. We should have went on this right. vacation. I should have taken more right. time to talk to the right this person. Who if was I'd have made him go to child. the doctor. Or if I'd have done this exactly. Mm-hmm. And so uh, God just showed me mercy <laughs> verses everywhere. And then we had a ladies retreat, and it was just not long after that she passed away. And I was the pastor that was running the retreat, so I had to be there. I didn't really run the retreat, but I felt I needed to be there. I heard there were three messages back-to-back on the mercy of God. And I can't ever remember hearing a message on the mercy of God, you know? But uh-huh. it was just incredible. Mercy, uh-huh. God is merciful. And, and you know, my wife, my mother lost her, my father, and uh, the bone cancer. 
And she married a year later, and a year after that, she lost my stepfather, who was a godly man, to the same bone cancer. No kidding. And so she had been through the mill. Yeah. And I said to my mother, I said, I just feel so guilty. I don't know why I feel guilty, but I feel so guilty. She said, that's natural. That's normal. Yeah. She had been through it, you know, and that's yeah. all part of it. Yeah. So, you know, you need to cast that off, you know, if you're going through grief. But that that is one of the things in the mercy of God. I used to... Uh, have grief waves. And I'd like to talk a little bit about that. Too. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you know uh, everybody knows Spafford. It is wealth, Horatio my soul. Spafford. Yeah, it is wealth, my soul. And, you know, the story is that uh, he was a wealthy attorney in Chicago. Mm -hmm. He had uh, a lot of real estate. Mm -hmm. His son passed away, and I believe he had three or four daughters. And uh, with the great Chicago fire, he lost a lot Everything. of his real estate. Yep. Yeah. And he sent his wife, they decided to go on a European trip. He sent his wife and, and daughters to Europe, and he had to finish up some business before he could go. And this was a good motivation because they were going to meet up with their friend, D.L. Moody, and help him. Right. And he, he was over in England. Yep. And they were going to help him yep. on his campaign. Storm came up. The daughters were lost at sea. And the wife made it. And she sent a telegram back, said, saved alone. And so he got on the ship, and, and the captain was kind enough to show him where his daughters had met their watery grave. And he wrote uh, words that is well with my soul. Mm -hmm. but it says, when sorrows like grief billows roll. Mm. And we sing that in church and never think about it. Right. But I learned a lot about uh, grief billows, uh, grief waves. Yeah. And they would come on me at, at the weirdest times, unannounced. All of a sudden, I'd just be in tears and hyperventilating and I grab my Bible and hold it to my chest. And they would, I said, when I was out and about, I said, Lord, don't let this happen to me out in public, you know, yeah. but it would happen when I was alone. So I called uh, uh, a pastor, his name's green up in Michigan. I don't know. I can't. Yeah. You had the greens of Tim green. And yeah, uh, I think of that dad. No, yeah, it's not been, Tim. He, is, the, it, is it the, the guy who's in his eighties? I think yes. he just, he just retired right, recently. Right. I think so. Yeah. He's, he's an old war horse from way back. Yes. But, uh, I, I he lost his, his wife. Uh -huh. Yeah, he lost his wife. And so I, I didn't know him well. I had him speak for, with, for me in a meeting I had once, but mm -hmm. I didn't know him very well. Uh, but I called him because he had been through it. And I said, is this ever going to stop? And he said, yes, it will. He said, it'll stop. I mean, at that, at that point, you wonder if, if you're ever going to get over it. Right. And he said, I used, he said, I used to sit up in bed at night and sing hymns at the top of my voice to where the neighbors would call the police <laughs> and uh, because it was so loud. You yeah. Know? And, and so that gave me comfort to know that, you know, somebody else had gone through the same thing. Yeah. When, when, uh, when, <clears throat> when a person's in deep grief, if you can think of a softball, I think when I was a kid, I never had a softball with a cover on it. You know, mm -hmm. we'd take electrical tape and wrap around it <laughs> uh -huh. you know, because we couldn't afford to buy one. Yeah. Or a golf ball, and you take the cover off of it. It, it yeah. just looks like a, a bunch of rubber bands strings, or yeah. strings yeah. that are every which way. Mm -hmm. Our emotions are made in such a way that they're linear. So you see somebody you don't like. I don't like that person. You know? <laughs> right. Or you see somebody you love. I love that person or, uh, yeah. you know, whatever. So you have basically one emotion going into time, maybe two. Yeah. When you have uh, grief, all your emotions come to the surface and tangle up like inside that ball. Uh huh. And you can't you can't separate your emotions. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you something else: it's hard to hear God. Yeah. Now I don't know how many Christians today hear God anyway. Right. But I've spent my whole life listening to the still yeah. small voice of the Holy Spirit. That's right. how we get our sermons. Right. You know, I'll say, Lord, what do you want me to preach? And it's like a woman saying, what's for supper? You know, what do you want for supper? Yeah. yeah. And the Lord always impacts me with a topic or a, a message or, yeah. or a passage of Scripture. But when I was going through grief, I couldn't hear God. And he said, that sounds strange because, you know, he's with us in trials. But Job couldn't either. Right. Job, or God it, communicated. David, how long will thou be silent? Right. You know? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And I mean, we don't want to talk in, about that because we're super spiritual and in, God always uh, talks to us, but that's not it, always. It probably had, it's yeah. a lot of, to do with your physical grief. Like, right. you know, I had COVID a few, eh, I don't know anyway, I don't have to worry. <laughs> that's good. But uh, I'd say six or seven weeks ago, and it's amazing how when you're physically down, it also feels spiritual yes like i was telling somebody just, and this was true like 
when I started feeling better, I noticed it in the morning when I read my Bible, I actually got something out of it. It's <laughs> like, wow, I got something out of my Bible yeah, today. I yeah. must be feeling better. <laughs> well, that's yeah, true. And, you know, I mean, we're, we're too proudful, prideful to admit that, yeah. that, that, you know, God's not talking to me today. But it's not that God wasn't talking, but we couldn't receive it. Right. And remember, Job, God is always speaking. Yeah. Job, Job yeah. said, Job said, oh, if the Almighty would just talk to me. Right. Well, before the Bible was written, God did do that, I mm-hmm. believe. And, and, mm-hmm. and uh, at Mount Sinai is basically when the people said, don't talk to us anymore. It scares us. Mm-hmm. But Job was used to communicating with God right. on, on a personal basis. Right. If God would just, he could not hear God talk to him. Mm-hmm. And when I, when I learned that, I, I read a commentary in the book of Job to a really good one, which I don't want to mention the author because I don't want to promote the guy, but he, it was an excellent book. Yeah. Job. yeah. But, but when I read that and realized that Job had that same blockage, mm-hmm. I preached for a solid year, and I wasn't confident that I was preaching what God wanted me to preach. Yes. And uh, where I'm always confident of that, I mean, almost 99%. There, there's a saying uh, by Vance Havner, uh, he used to say, "Faith him when you can't feel him." Mm-hmm. And so every you know, so, so, you know, sometimes you have to walk in the darkness. Yes, we're not giving you uh, permission to stay in the darkness, right. but sometimes you just have to right. trust that the Lord is there, even when you can't feel him. I'll say this: so I, I knew that Jesus was there. Mm-hmm. That, is, that sounds like contradiction. Okay. Yeah. As far as the communication and we all that. We just said that person going through grief is schizophrenic. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's true. No, it's going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's exactly right. But I knew that Jesus was there, even though I couldn't feel the communication part of it. In other words, I began to understand that how a person can be in a concentration camp and their faith sustains them. Now, that mm-hmm. sounds um, maybe hokey or it sounds yeah. you know over the top, but it's not. And I, I'll tell you what. I came to realize if everything in this life was taken away from me, my home, my job, everything yeah. was taken away from me, Jesus would still be there. Amen. Because he's the same yesterday, today, yeah. forever, and he'll not forsake us. Yeah. He said, I'll never leave thee, I'll never mm. forsake thee. And so he, I knew that he was there and faithful no matter what. Yeah. And, and what I told him was, you're stuck with me. Amen. You're stuck with me, we, and and that's what Job said. That, Though you slay yeah. me, yet well, I trust Amen. you. And I told the Lord this too. I said, after Wesley died, and and I got to tell you a story about this too. Mm. But after Wesley died, and after Brenda died, I said, Lord, don't put another brick in my wagon. Or it'll break. Yeah. You know what God did? He put another brick in my wagon. Yeah. And, and it didn't break. Yeah. Because underneath are the everlasting arms. Amen. And so I know that whatever a person can go through, God will take care of, and he will be there. We, uh, we're we going through the book of James. We just started going through the book of James on Wednesday night and, you know, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, mm-hmm. knowing that the trying of your faith, we're patience and patience, hope. And, yep. and, and then the end is perfection. But I made this statement. <laughs> I see people looking at me. I say, you don't even know if you're saved or not unless your faith is tested. Right. But when you go through a dark valley and your faith sustains you, a lot of times people going through trials do have joy. I don't know how many times, um, you know, you, I go up to the hospital and as a pastor thinking of something encouraging you can give them when you're there and you go and they're the ones who encourage you. Yes, I've seen Because that. their faith is undergirding them through that trial and right. they're rejoicing in the fact that my faith um, in Christ is all I need. Right. You can have a guy in a concentration camp. He has no mm-hmm. hope of any future, but they can't take Jesus away. Right. And, you know? and we've seen that, you know, yeah. Corey Ten Boom right. and Darlene Dibler Rose and others, yeah. you know, they could be in mm-hmm. a prison of affliction. I had the funeral of a fellow a few years ago. He was a fight, he was a fighter pilot in World War II, mm-hmm. almost shot down the first time up, ended up being a, um, a major in uh, Vietnam when he retired. So he went all the way through. And I wouldn't say he was a strong believer, but he was there every, you know, just about every Sunday and, mm-hmm. and, and that. And so on his deathbed, he had, he was dying, but he wasn't, you know, he hadn't, it was one of those situations that they withhold the medication, he would die, which is yeah. basically what happened, right or wrong. I'm not saying that was right. But I asked him, I said, why is post-traumatic stress seemingly so much worse now than it was, say, in World War II? And, and and I understand there's other reasons. I mean, mm-hmm. sometimes the battles are more intense or more frequent and that mm-hmm. kind of thing. Not taken away from anybody. Yeah. But I said, why do you think? He said, 
He said it's lack of religion. Oh. Lack of religion. Sure. I've got a book on World War I, uh, and it talks about how when they would find the bodies of the Germans, and, of course, they were steeped in uh, higher criticism, which is liberalism. Yeah. Uh, they didn't have a – they didn't believe in salvation or any of that. Uh, but they would have a look of terror in their face. When they saw the American GI who had just come through some of the great revivals, uh, they had a look of peace in their face. Wow. And that's all documented. Yeah. And I think there's a lot to that. You know, Absolutely. Really. So. And I, I would think even now, um, you have to be a born-again believer to go to heaven, uh, but then even unbelievers went to church and they did right. believe in a reason for everything. And that was yes. God. Yes. Uh, or now, yeah, we live, you know, God is dead, you know, post Christian America yep. and people, there's way more, uh, depression. And I imagine it's a lot harder for people to get over the loss of loved ones right. because there's no rhyme or reason. Right. But everything was just an accident. Do you know, who Norris Belcher is. Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Good, good man. I, I haven't, I've lost track, but sure, you know, yeah, me too. Everything, everything I know is I've good. Just heard of him, yeah. yeah everything <laughs> yeah, everything yeah. I know is good. Yeah. They all fall, yeah. But when when Wesley died, that was my three year old grandson. Uh-huh. When he passed away, you know, we got in a we rented a fifteen passenger van, took people, and we headed to Missouri, and I, I beat the and you know the crap out of that van going down there, yeah. And we were there a week or I don't even know how long, and came back. Well, my desk was just covered with mail, you know, as it always is. And I'm going through the mail, right? And I see this letter from Norris Belcher. And I thought, well, oh, that's interesting. You know, it had an actual stamp on it. It wasn't a bulk permit. Yeah. I open it up, and it says, uh, uh, Dear uh, Pastor Craig. And see, I advertised in the sword of the Lord, and so mm-hmm, did he. Mm-hmm. He said, uh, we just wanted you to know that we have made you the pastor of the month at our church, and we've been praying for you all month. Very nice. Wow. Yeah. I, that was so encouraging. Yeah. And so I thought, well, that's that's a neat coincidence. You know, I mean, there's no coincidences, but so when Brenda died, I had a funeral in Penfield and then I had another funeral in uh, Pennsylvania in her hometown where where I buried her, my hometown. Yeah. But we had 25 people at camp in Pennsylvania. And I thought, well, they would like to say a goodbye. Mm -hmm. And a few relatives, undertaker told me, asked me how many was going to show up. I said, "Eh, maybe 30. Yeah, three hundred and some people showed up from foreign countries too. Wow. I, I couldn't believe it. Yeah, it was, I didn't even advertise it. You know. Yeah. I, anyway, um, so I, you know, I was involved in all that. Came back, a man, uh, another man. He'd been a fighter pilot too. He trained fighter pilots World War II. His wife passed away, and he called the church and nobody answered and so forth. And so he had somebody else do the funeral at the graveside. Well, I found out about it and I made it to the graveside. And I hugged him. I said, this is the first time I can tell you I really understand what you're going through. Yeah. So I go back to my office covered with mail. And I'm going through the mail, and there's a letter from Norris Belcher hmm. a year, about a year later. And you're the, you're the guy of the month I'm again. I'm the pastor of the month. And uh, there's a church and a, and a group of people that are sensitive to the Holy Spirit. I almost dropped my teeth if I could have. Yeah. And so I called him. I said, Brother Belcher, are you sitting down? You, this happened twice. Now, that's not a coincidence. That's the mercy of God. Yeah. You know? Amen. So even though you may not be able to hear God, he is there. We know that. But then he shows you those little mercy drops. Yes. You know, yeah. As well. Yeah. He, he, yeah, he, yeah, he lets you know that, that, uh, that this was part of his divine right. plan and divine providence right. and, and I different that ways. Was a real neat story, you know? Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. That's fabulous. Some things I don't want to forget. These things just don't happen. In, um, also, the Lord put people on your pathway that had walked that road mm-hmm. ahead of you, and um, right. and they di- they did know what you were going through, and they were able to reach out to you and be a yes. blessing, like uh, Pastor Green there in Michigan, mm-hmm. and then um, you know, and now the shoes on the other foot, where somebody who is going through a problem, you know, I think of Second Corinthians chapter number one, uh, the God of all comfort is going to comfort us right. with the comfort that the Holy Spirit is going to give, that we'll be able to comfort others. Yes. So you've received that comfort, and now uh, you can be a comfort to other people who are going through the same trial. I, I had a, uh, a pastor call me in, in an inner city church, and he said, I want you to do a, a ladies' ba- meeting, you know, breakfast, mm-hmm. ladies' breakfast. There's quite a few ladies there. Yeah. And he said, I want you to speak on grief. And I said, what? You know, you, you don't talk about grief at a ladies' uh, you know, breakfast. 
but I do what the pastor wants, you know. Mm-hmm. So I did. I couldn't believe it. They had been involved. They they have lost all lost loved ones over drive by shootings, overdosing, you know those kind of things, uh, and the need was great. Mm-hmm. And like I said, going back, I think a lot of pastors underestimate, you know, what the need that their people really have. Sure. You know, with some of these things. And grief is reality 101. And yep. so it might not, um, you know, because a lot of times we feel like we're, we got to be some sort of an entertainer on Sunday morning right. or whatever. But um, who was it that coined this? Um, that if you preach to hurting people, you'll never lack an audience. That's true. I, I uh, somebody said that. Yeah. Somebody, you can somebody Google, smart you said can that. Google it <laughs> and smart. find out who said yeah. it. But, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, there is a need to comfort it really uh, is true. people out there. Yes. And you have, and I'm interested in seeing this too, you have uh, from David in Ziklag. Z- Ziklag, yes. Um, I'm going to go to my notes with yeah. this a little bit. Uh, you know, the, the, the stages of grief laid yeah. out right in the Bible. When you... Uh, when you look at the stages of grief, I mean, you go on the internet, you'll see different ones. Right. You know, and I think that's because different people have different experiences mm-hmm. and things. Mm-hmm. But I'm just going to go down through the list real quick, and then I want to compare it to First Samuel chapter 30. Okay. Okay. Because I said to myself, if the stages of grief are true, they're in the Bible. Right. If it's not in the Bible, it's still going to be true, but it's not as likely. Yes. You know, I mean, that would be skeptical. And it's not that important if it's right. not in the Bible, that could, or else God would have put it in there. Lots of people don't go through all the stages. Mm-hmm. Some of them go through stages in, in mixed-up order. But one thing you got to understand about the stages of grief is that there's two clocks. There's a clock in our head and a clock in our heart. Okay. You know, and I challenge anybody to look up all the verses on the heart. Mm-hmm. There's an intelligence in the heart mm-hmm. besides the brain. Mm-hmm. The heart is the seat of our emotions. Right. And brain is supposedly the seat of logic, which is, doesn't seem to be true of a lot of people but it's supposed, <laughs> right, supposed, right. supposed to be yeah. supposed to be logical what happens is as one goes through these stages of grief the clock in the head moves faster than the clock in the sure. heart so your head begins to say you know, i'm doing better I've, I've got over that hurdle and you start getting great. into new routines and things right. like that but you then start, yeah then the heart remembers mm-hmm. and it resets so then it turns the clock in the brain backwards, and you say, I'm never going to get out of this. Mm-hmm. So then there's those setbacks. And that's why you can't say these stages are going to be for everybody in a certain order. Right. And it's going to take a lot of back and forth to get through it. But I wrote down, you know, first of all, shock and, or, mm-hmm. and denial. Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> this is a mistake everybody makes. When you go to a funeral, um, right after Brenda died, it might have been six weeks, another good pastor friend of mine, his wife died. In, uh, in Philadelphia. So I said, you know what, I'm going to go to that funeral. So I sat beside an evangelist, and the pastor was up by the casket, and he was joking around, you know, and talking to people. And so the fellow sitting beside me, and this points out why I don't think we really understand as mm-hmm, pastors. Mm-hmm. He said, oh, he looks like he's doing great. I said, no, he's in shock. Yeah, right, absolutely. Yeah. So I called him a week later. I said, brother, how you doing? Oh, Pastor Craig, not so good. Sure. Yeah. So you got that yeah. shock or denial. Yeah, and that's, uh, we, we talked about this before the podcast yeah. is that uh, initially you used a sh- shock, and that would be more accurate than I said. I said people are very stoic initially, mm-hmm. and I don't know it has to do with the plans, the preparations, and everything. Uh, but, yeah, I've noticed that time and again when people lose a loved one up into the funeral and after all the plans are made, they're like, I'm doing good. You know, we're yeah. doing yeah. – yeah. And then the heart sets them back, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and that's that's tough. Then there's guilt, pain and guilt, and that's normal. Mm-hmm. You know, we talked about that. And then there's bargaining and anger. Of, of all these stages, the one that's probably sin is the anger. Mm-hmm. And that's where, you know, the guy gets run over the freight train. I'm going to sue the doctor because he didn't save my, you know, my husband. Yes. You know, so you lash out at a relative, you lash out at the doctor, whatever. That needs to be brought under the blood of Christ. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that anger is never, never right. Okay, I mean, and, and that would fall in the line of um, hurting people, hurt others. Right, right. I yeah. mean, justice is different. You know, mm-hmm. as if somebody shoots your wife or your husband, right? You, you know, still, different thing. still, there ought to be you know forgiveness, this and that. But I'm talking, you know, the normal things. And then there's depression and loneliness. Uh, then there's the upward turn when they begin to 
think about the future or how things you know need to change. There's a little light at the end of the tunnel. Reconstruction, where you're beginning to think about, you know, what can I do to get to my new normal? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, that's the stage, and acceptance and hope. Those are the stages that people need to consciously work on so that they're not stuck in grief. Uh, you know, there, as I said, there have been people for years and years and years they've been stuck in grief. It's because right. they've not taken initiative for the new normal. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, when you go back to Ziglag, uh, with David in First Samuel 30, and this is, you know, God showed me this. This wasn't something I found in a book. In verses 1 and 4, it says, It came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziglag, on the third day the Amalekites had invaded the south, and Ziglag was smitten, Ziglag, and burned with and burned it with fire. They had taken the women captive, and were therein, therein they slew not any. They didn't kill any of them, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city, Behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captive. And David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until there was no more power to weep. So can you imagine? You know, you come home, your your wife's gone, your kids are gone, all your everything the house is empty. I mean, that's I, I came home one time, the kids were gone. I didn't know where they were. Mm -hmm. uh, it turns out they thought they heard a noise, you know, and so they ran down on the neighbors and when we finally found them, they were in the lap. One of them was in the lap of the lady, and they were reading storybooks, and everything was great. I said, what happened? They said, well, we heard this noise. So I said, what would you do? They went in the bathroom, shut the door, and my one child, uh, I think it was, I don't know, it might have been Nathan, had a butcher knife. And my, my daughter, she had a can of hairspray and a lighter. <laughs> okay. Okay? There you go. And so the plan was <laughs> that as soon as the uh, burglar or whatever opened the door, she was going to hit him with flame, and my son was going to stab, stab him, him to death. Wow. Chip off the old block. Wow. There, you yeah, know? there you go. So they had a plan, and then they felt safe enough to run out you know, and everything. But uh, when you come home to a home where it's the kids and the wife are gone, so you see that they were in unbelief uh -huh. and shock in uh -huh. verses 1 through 4. Verses 6 and 4, we see they grief. It says they lifted up their voice and wept mm -hmm. until they had no more power to weep. And that kind of illustrates how the Jewish people grieved. I mean, they would. Very, you know, they very would, vocal. Yeah, they would hire people to grieve with them, you know. That's a funny story. Uh, Trump, when he came down the golden escalator, yeah. hired people to cheer. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah, right, right. You know, yeah. so they were willing to let it out. Yes, you know? yeah, and you've seen with Jesus' time, professional um Whalers, there Whalers, at the, yeah, yeah, at the resurrection of uh, it was Jerry's daughter or yep. somebody's daughter. Yep. Uh, there, yeah. Uh, I did a Korean what uh, Korean wedding, Korean funeral one time, and I didn't realize they do that. Oh. And at the graveside, yeah, they um, yeah they let it out. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. and then in verse six, you have irrational anger. They said they were gonna. Well, I read it here. They said they were gonna stone David. Let's see, it says uh, and David was greatly distressed for the people spake of stoning him. These 600 mighty men mm -hmm. would have died for David mm -hmm. an hour before yeah, this. Yeah. But now they want to kill him. Now they're going to kill him. See, mm -hmm. that's your rational act. Yeah. You know, that's, that's very evident. And so, uh, and then that take, they took initiative. And verses 6 through 9, uh, David uh, comforted himself from the Lord and mm -hmm. said, Lord, what shall I do? And, God's, and he said, shall I pursue? And God said, go get him. Mm -hmm. And so David made plans for recovery. And then you see verses 16 and 18, he recovered all. So the wives were safe, the children were safe, yeah. he recovered all. Yeah. And uh, so one of the key things, I mean, you, when someone dies, the next day you're not going to get to this place. Right. But as you work through these things, you need to come to the place where you embrace a new normal. Mm -hmm. And make plans for a new normal. A new purpose. A new purpose in life and, and you know, right, a new identity. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if somebody doesn't know the Lord, really can't do this. That's right. Like, the Bible says, we sorrow not as others which have no hope. Right. So, you know, if you put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, he died for our sins, was buried, mm -hmm. rose again the third day. When you, when you accept him, he comes into our lives, into mm -hmm. our bodies, and, and he will help us work through these That's things. Right. So, you know, the Bible isn't saying that, you know, you're not going to sorrow. It's such that you're not going to sorrow as others. As which, those who have no which hope. have no hope. Right, right. Exactly. Yeah, and, you know, I heard somebody at the funeral yesterday, and well-intentioned, uh, say, now, he wouldn't want us to be sad. 
<laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. and I'm thinking, well, yeah, again, there's sorrow, right? But you you can't sorrow as those who have no hope, right? Because it is terrible. You're not going to see your loved one again until right. you go to heaven. The thing that preachers and most people miss is that 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 grieving person at a funeral. And I'm not talking about the friend mm -hmm. uh, that's there because they just want to be supportive. I mean, that's great. Or a distant relative that, you know, feels bad. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the person that lost a lot, you know, a wife or a son or right. whatever. Okay, that person. Most preachers don't realize that we don't do a lot of good at funerals. Yeah. And the reason is uh, we tell them that their loved one is a, has peace and joy and happiness and youth and, and all that in heaven, and it's wonderful. But the grieving person does not want their loved one in heaven. Want them here. They want them back. Yeah. And and that's not right, but that's the reality mm -hmm. of it. And, you know, I, I was the same way. I You know, I what did I want? I wanted my wife back. Yeah. I wanted my life back. And Yeah, I don't care if she's better off there. I want her here. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. And I said, God, help me. You yeah. know, but yeah. I read this poem in the funeral home. I, I have it written here. For tears could, if tears could build a stairway and memories were a lane, I'd walk all the way to heaven and bring you back again. Mm -hmm. No farewell words were spoken that was true for me. No time to say goodbye. You were gone before I knew it, and only God knows why. My heart still aches in sadness, and secret tears still flow. What it meant to lose you, no one will ever know. And I said, God help me. That's the way I feel. Right. You know, I I want you back. Mm -hmm. And I said, that is the most selfish thing, but it's still true. Yeah, absolutely. And so I've learned, you know, I've had a lot of funerals where most of the congregation that came was of another faith. Yes. Another communion, if you will. Yeah. Okay. And usually there's a lot of walls put up. You yes. Know, uh, you're, you're not our church, you're a Baptist no. or whatever, right. so we're not going to listen or give you a break, you know. Right. But when I started preaching on things like Ziglag yeah. and, and went through the stages of grief that mm -hmm. are biblical, mm -hmm. I had people, and this is maybe overstating, but almost on the edge of their seat. Yeah. They loved it. And it broke down the barriers and gave me an opportunity to give the gospel in a way I would never have before. Yeah, amen. So when, what, what a grieving person needs to know is that there is hope. You will go through these, mm -hmm. these processes mm -hmm. and, and that you will be able to come out the other end victoriously, we mm -hmm. uh, you know, with God's help, and, 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 and life will be good again. Right. And, right, and that's what they need to hear. They need hope. Yeah, not they need to hear you know your loved ones in heaven if they were saved, right. of course, and all that. Right. I mean that's good, but that doesn't really and then that's feed the, the bearer, and that's know? the big separator between us and unbelievers. And um, it is you do have distinct differences in congregations that you'll speak to at funerals. Right, and I've had some wild ones. <laughs> I, I, I remember this one fellow. I did uh, his funeral in Michigan. He was supposedly Baptist, uh, but he migrated from Michigan or uh, from West Virginia to go work at the Big Three, which a lot mm -hmm. of West. I think the capital of West Virginia was uh, Flint, Michigan. Yeah, but I mean everybody <laughs> emigrated there right. uh, to work in the plants or Gary, and, Indiana. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I heard Akron. I heard uh, Akron, Ohio, too. Had uh, you know half of West Virginia living <laughs> yeah. there uh, back in the tire plant days. Uh, so, man, I remember one service that I did. They they were playing country and westerns before I got up, <laughs> and they they played the uh, go, go rest high yeah. on that mountain. <laughs> and I mean, the people started. I'd never been in it. So, I mean, they were bawling together with this sad country song. And yeah. then, you know, then I'm expected to get up there and preach after right. that. Right. And you're just not, uh, my spirit was not bearing witness with yeah. theirs and theirs was not with mine. And that was too different night and day, yeah, yeah. you know, where, wild. whereas we had a great Christian funeral yesterday for Fred Love. I don't know if you know yeah, him. I, yes. A great testimony. You yeah. know, people there who he led to Christ and, right. and um, you know, just testimony after testimony, mm -hmm. completely different spirit. Yeah. Uh, but the reality is, is yes, we do have hope, but you're going to, you're going to go through that grieving process right. as a believer. Right. Yeah. 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 Amen. So it's, it's, uh, it's something that 
we need to be better trained at, mm-hmm. you know, as pastors. Yes. Really. How can we do some better training for listen, that? Listen think? to me. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> I think, no, that, seriously, that, I, you know, if you wanted to, some good material, the grief share has some mm-hmm. excellent material. Mm-hmm. It really does. Mm-hmm. The, the problem I had with the grief share was when you have a group, it's almost like group therapy in some ways, uh, you can be, they can begin to feed on each other and mm-hmm. then get stuck in grief a little bit. That's not the, that's not the idea of it. But I found that to be one downfall. But so they their identity a lot of times um, they right. identify themselves with the grief, right? The incident that happened right. instead of with the Lord Jesus Christ right. first off. And that may have been my fault as a leader. You know, probably was. Yeah. Uh, but their material is excellent. Mm-hmm. You know, anybody that you know you could trust their material. Yeah. Because uh, they really have a good handle on it. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. So, yeah. And then and then for. Um, also for laymen, perhaps are not a counselor, uh, but someone in their church is going through grief. Uh, what would be some recommendations for how they could be a blessing to someone who's grieving the loss of a loved one? Just be there mm-hmm. and be sensitive. Mm-hmm. You know, be sensitive that I've had. I had some people was like, you know, please leave. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Sure. And and they're all well meaning. Yeah. You know. Uh, a little, a little gift, a little no. Yep. Again, we Just love you. We're simple. praying for you, thinking right. about you. You don't have to get into details. Let them know that your door is open and that they are welcome to come to you. In um, <laughs> when you when you lost Wesley, uh, you got that letter from um, Norris, uh, uh, Belcher. Norris Belcher. Yep. And then when you lost your wife, you got that letter from Norris Belcher. Right. I mean, those things just meant a lot. He didn't he didn't even know you're going through right. anything. Right. So if a little gift, yep. a little token saying hey we're thinking about you i had more food than i could put in my freezer amen <laughs> finally i had to tell people you know yeah. i got enough here yeah uh, but yeah those things are appreciated right you know and it meant a lot right even if right. you didn't like the food they're bringing you <laughs> so it was all th- pretty good yeah so it's all Baptists the, can cook that's right true. right so it's all you know all the thought <laughs> yeah. behind that that right. people just let you know right that they're there Yep. Yeah, and you think of Job's friends. Three days, they didn't say anything. Mm-hmm. They, did they were better. really good friends <laughs> they did until they opened up their mouth. That's right. That's yeah. right. Amen. So, Amen. Yeah. Any other thoughts or anything? No, I, that's about it. Uh, I just hope I've been a blessing to somebody. Amen. I you think know, you I have. Like, You've like been a blessing to, be a to me, so I'm one. Amen. And that's anybody good. else who, who uh, listens in, I'll uh, get a blessing as well. Uh, put a little plug in for your your uh, your work that you do. and I do... I do whatever comes into my hand, mm-hmm. and you know when I retired from the pastor, I, I retired from the pastor because of back surgery. I knew I'd be off my legs for about a year, which is almost almost a year. And I told the Lord, "I'll do whatever you want me to do." Uh, you know my phone number. You know mm-hmm. God knows your phone number, you right? Know yeah, yeah. And just as soon as I could get up and preach on a stool, my phone started ringing, and I've been busy. Every Sunday, I right. do. I love to do prophetic Bible conferences. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll, I'll come and do a grief Sunday, you know. Amen. And uh, but the main thing I do is financial seminars, and uh, we just got the Dave Ramsey endorsement for our agency, you know. So we're kind of proud of that. It's been a, it's yeah. open doors for us. Yeah, that's great. And uh, but I've been doing. I did financial seminars before Dave Ramsey even right. thought about it. You know. Yeah. Uh, but. I use a lot of his material. And, mm-hmm. you know, for us, particularly a smaller church that can't afford Dave Ramsey or the, even the videos, whatever, the difference between him and me is that I actually have the products to help the person and, right. and can, you know, give them the, the best, you know, the best uh, price and that kind of thing. Amen. But, you know, it's, uh, I love doing the financial seminars. Yeah. And then yeah. lots of times it'll be a Saturday and then I'll do a stewardship Sunday. Mm-hmm. So it's a weekend, mm-hmm. you know, package. Yep. And you've done that and here. Yeah, I had one it's church tell me that the uh, offerings doubled the next Sunday. So I, was, Whoa. I didn't get a cut, though. Yeah, you, know, you, yeah you should get a percentage <laughs> off of that. Should, yeah. yeah. 10%. Uh, you, came, you came in the spring and we did have a financial weekend. Um, and then in this quarter, we've been able to pay off, I think it's 63 I was going to ask you 60, how that went. yeah sixty three thousand yeah. yeah. off the mortgage. Right. This Sunday, um, we are having the teens are putting on a dinner, and anything that comes in for this dinner is going to be matched. And so, you know, we're probably sixty five thousand. We paid off in one quarter yeah, off great. the mortgage. So Amen. yeah, no, it, it was uh, it was a blessing, and you're a part of that. Uh, so yeah, so if you're out there, you need a your preacher. You got a church. You need uh, pulpit supply. You need someone come in. A good preacher come in. Have uh, Pastor Craig in. He'll be a blessing to you. 
you or your people, or if you need uh, insurance on your uh, church, right? Give him a call. He will save you money. We almost save, guaranteed. I mean, yeah, we save the average church about a thousand a year. Yeah, you know, yeah. So, and, and mortgages. Uh, I saved one church so much money on their when I did a refi on their mortgage that the pastor was able to go full time. Amen. So they're they're pretty excited. I mean, they were looking at closing the doors. It was so backbreaking. Yes. And uh, you know, God bless them yeah. that way. And uh it's just that I mean, I haven't done a lot of those, mm-hmm. uh, but I, I'd love to try and yeah. help churches save money. Amen. I the, the vision I had, I, I started Craig Financial Ministries, which is just my wife, myself, and mm-hmm. I have a team of people that I refer to. Yeah. Because I'm not a financial advisor or planner. Uh so I have another Christian that I refer people to him and so forth. I, li- I like to keep it in the Christian community, right? you know, what I do. But as a pastor, I felt like everybody had their hand out. You know, some were, you know, the, the, the guy driving through town, he breaks an axle, the baby needs diapers, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. He's got his line down, mm-hmm. and churches are an easy mark. So there's that. But then there's the legitimate things, you know, like a missionary, mm-hmm. you know, that needs support. And then there's things like, you know, United Way wants to get a part of your offering. I mean, it's everybody's got their hand out. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And I said to myself, I want to start an organization where my hand's not out, but my hand is extended in giving mm-hmm. and helping yeah. in some way. So our goal is to save a church money under insurance, save money with the congregation. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I had one person come to me and said, you know, I think, I think uh, they had an old, old insurance policy. And that was on somebody that passed away years earlier. And they said, I think we're the contingent beneficiary. And I said, well, that's unlikely. Probably the beneficiary. No, no, they died, you know, first. And so one phone call, I made them money. <laughs> they were the an insurance company. When you owe them money, they can find you. <laughs> <laughs> but if they owe you money, yeah. <laughs> no, it's well, another thing. we'll wait till they contact yeah. us. Insurance yeah. isn't about, my wife hates me saying this, insurance isn't about paying claims, it's about paying premiums. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> you know, so, That's right. So, yeah. But, you know, I've, I've helped a lot of people, uh-huh. you know, find money they didn't know they had. Yeah. And, uh, you know, sit down, make budgets. I had one guy, I won't tell you where, big guy, big guy, though. And uh, I had sat, I sat down with his family, you know, several years prior to this event and uh, put him on a budget, you know, mm-hmm. showed him what he needed to cut out, you know, and what he needed to do. And so I went to a funeral at his church and I'd forgotten about the guy. You know, I can't remember everybody. And besides, he used to have red hair and now it's gray and, you know, uh-huh. he's different. Uh-huh. He gets out of his truck and he starts running toward me. And I said, I'm not a big guy. He is. And <laughs> I've learned uh, the importance of that uh, <laughs> scenario. And uh, it's like a dog, you know, it, the, the, the mouse growling, the tail's wagging. You don't know which end to believe. Yeah, right, 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 <laughs> so, right. so I didn't know what, what was happening. Pastor Craig, Pastor Craig said, what do you want? He said, in two weeks, I'll be totally debt free. And boy, that just made me feel great. You know, that's what it's about. Yeah. If we took all of our debt and interest and mm-hmm. put it in the offering plate, we could win the world to Christ. Amen. Yeah. But the devil's got us tied up in debt. Yeah. And so those are some of the things we yeah, talked about. That's great. That's yeah. great. Where can people find you at? Uh, www.craigagency.com. Okay, that's pretty simple. And they Sounds can good. find me through the website. Sounds good. Yeah. All right. Hey, thanks for being okay. on today. It's been My a pleasure privilege. as always. Thank you. And, and we'll do something great next time too. Sounds good. <laughs> Thank you so much today for watching this podcast. We hope you enjoyed it. Please like and subscribe to this channel. Also, if you'd like to reach out to us by way of email, you can email us at pastoral thoughts mail at gmail.com. And if you'd like to, I do write a blog and you can subscribe to that at pastorjack.org. Thank you. God bless you and have a great day.